So when there is sun and rain, we see the uh, spectra of colors. So today I'll be speaking about spectrometers. So it's very relevant. But most importantly, today I'll be focusing mostly about visible spectrometry techniques and the devices. So myself, I'm Chinna Devarpu. I'm a Kappa researcher. Uh, at, uh, I'm a researcher at Kappa Research Center, Munster Te Technological University, Ireland. And uh, next to me, uh, Richard Hopper will be speaking about one special class of spectrometers, and he's an RN engineer at IMS. So not anymore, but I, I used to work. Okay, okay, sorry, I got it from. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. But it's good to keep something uh, when I wrote about myself. Yeah. So sorry about that. Okay. Uh, my coming back to my background, I'm a nanophotonics uh, researcher. In my daytime, I work on making these small holes. These are 200 nanometers in size that are like a uh, thousand times in, in with respect to our human hair. Uh, we make using costly equipment and uh, these are the beautiful spectra sometimes these nanophotonics devices give. But uh, I also work on some of these uh, smartphone based devices or hacking the fitness trackers or sometimes centrifuge kind of devices uh, just that can be powered from smartphone. Today I'll be speaking mostly about these fitness trackers, how I hacked a few of them to make a small spectrophotometer and I will also show some of these kind of uh, prototypes made with the uh, smartphone. Uh, one can make a nice spectrometer out of a smartphone. I will show some of these demos uh, as well. It's a great privilege to speak about uh, spectrometers at Cambridge Biomagaspace because um, Newton first kind of discovered these kind of spectra by splitting the white light through a prism, passing through a prism. And these are the two historic images uh, kind of drawn uh, post Newton era, of course, um, but they give kind of a uh, impression how he used to experiment with light. It is one of his uh, primary focus area throughout his research career. For example, here the prism and here you can see the color wheel as well. So it's very, um, it's a big privilege for me to speak about spectrometers here. Now, in his era, Newton used to speak about the colors, what he saw in a rainbow, uh, red, yellow, green, blue, and violet. But later he said that he could not recognize orange quite well. But now we know that uh, what he called as uh, colors in a rainbow. Now these are a little bit modernized to uh, include the seven colors. At the time, it it is kind of a mythological way of thinking the colors in a spectra. For example, Greek mythology says that, you know, seven objects, seven notes in a music instrument, these are all kind of related. But now we know that uh, these are the seven primary colors in a spectra, but if you look for every nanometer of uh, wavelength, um, the, the color changes. Although most of the Newton era spectrometry is about the visible spectrometer, and visual spectroscopy. But later on, we come to know there are many wavelengths of light and these are all important for important applications. Today, although I will be focusing about the visible spectrometer, keep in mind that all these uh, ultraviolet spectrometry, X-ray spectrometry, these are all very relevant. For example, you might have been all seen these uh, rover landing on the Mars. If you see the th three key instruments are spectrometers. Uh, as you can see here, the ultraviolet spectrometer, X-ray spectrometer uh, in Sherlock, and also this um, mast cam. It also has a multispectral imaging camera. So you can, you can understand the importance of spectrometers in life. Whenever we need to look for new life as well, we need these spectrometers. Of course, today you are not here to learn about all these um, high-tech spectrometers used in the mass rover, but how we can use these spectrometers in uh, in your biology experiments, either at home, for example, some of you told homebrew uh, is, is there a hobby. 
also multispectral imaging is kind of gaining a big momentum with the drone cameras equipped with uh, multispectral imaging uh, sensors similarly more uh, biologists who work with uh, day to day cell culture and all they work with the um, uh, spectrophotometers fluorescence measurements bioreactors biomolecular identification these kind of uh, applications more generally going if you can uh, think the broad area of applications in water quality monitoring or diagnostics so we will cover some of these applications but not going into any detail because mostly about the hardware and how you can uh, think about some low cost spectral sensors primarily i will be focusing about ams spectral sensors uh, as you can see here it's a breakout board from uh, spark one but the main uh, guy is this ams spectral sensors uh, richard will be focusing on this uh, i'll be speaking about rest of these spectral sensors uh, one is the hamamatsu spectro microspectrometer uh, toshiba linear ccd there's a big historical um, historical way of getting into the toshiba linear ccd why it is so important another one is this co uh, spectral sensor it is very popular uh, at one point of time uh, it is still uh, trying to uh, try to commercialize its handheld spectrometer and apart from this i will also speak about some of the smartphone based spectrometers and fitness tracker based uh, spectrophotometers now coming back to basics um, as i mentioned previously newton used to see the spectra through a prism uh, still some spectroscopes uh, depend on this principle and it's a nice in, nice intuitive way of uh, getting back to the light dispersion so when a white light hits a prism it splits into different colors and what it forms we call as a spectrum and if you can see that spectrum through a device we call that device as a spectroscope and if you can record and measure this uh, each individual line you know the spectra then we call it as a spectrometer it's a little bit of uh, sometimes confusion in the way we speak colloquially uh, within ourselves these spectrometers and spectroscopes but for today's purpose we can call them as spectrometers there are many different types of spectrometers uh, recently science has done a wonderful job of releasing a review article on comparing many miniaturized spectrometers but even the bulky spectrometers mostly uh, can be divided into these four classes of uh, spectrometers today in briefly if i uh, just give a four classes dispersive optic space spectrometers narrow band filter based spectrometers fourier transform based spectrometers and reconstructive spectrometers although this area is mostly interesting for me my uh, research purposes i will not speak about this at all and this uh, may be a little but today's focus will be about dispersive optics and narrow band filters based um, based spectrometers when it comes to the dispersive optic spectrometers there are many schemes to make it low cost um the main objective is to for example focus on this picture because this is going to be the most relevant picture the light comes here and hits a grating and it will splash into this uh, detector the dispersed spectrum is detected by this uh, ccd array this is the one uh, mostly sold by hamamatsu but we'll come back to this in detail Uh, keep in mind that original uh, ocean optic spectrometers are also based on this similar technique the light is uh, come to come through a fiber port and reflected from a grating and the spectra is recorded on a ccd this is very very important and the other other class of spectrometer as i mentioned earlier the filters based uh, this will be covered in detail by uh, richard but the principle is that each color will be uh, kind of filtered by a small part on the ccd and recorded and later on combined to give a uh, spectra based on this principle the two uh, broadly uh, the most widely use, used spectrometers are ams spectrometers and co spectrometer and this is this one is from the ocean optics so as i mentioned earlier th this uh ccd linear ccd based spectrometers based on the dispersive optics is most popular why because 
the in early 90s oceanop peaks kind of revolutionized the spectrometry uh, market by releasing a handheld spectrometer that doesn't require external power so it just runs with the usb uh, cable and it's quite portable and as i explained earlier it has this white light coming onto a uh, grating and hitting a linear ccd if you want to put a cuvette in between the light uh, in between the spectrometer and the light you can put like this and this is the most used configuration in the labs even today uh, when it comes to low cost but people who would like to uh, exploit this for the low cost uh, spectrometer applications picked up the ccd inside the ocean optic spectrometers they found out that these are the most commonly used ccds inside the ocean optic spectrometers and their price is quite low and they are available in single pieces or in bulk so for example if you see this is the ocean optic spectrometer and this is the open source version of it you can find in hackaday it has the similar uh, geometry uh, light uh, incoming port and a dispersive uh, grating and a ccd another hugely popular open source um, spectrometry is this kind of uh, water vis spectrometer it is uh, made by russell it is very very useful and he mentioned in his blog the community developed around this kind of spec, uh, ccd we also got hands on this ccd and we try to make it a very low cost one uh, running of this uh, stm nucleo board and using a jewelers jewelers Uh, spectroscope uh, it's a tube kind of device i will show in a minute uh, taking a little pause from from the presentation and we found out it gives a very nice spectra the problem is we had to resolve the sodium lamp li lines uh, to see its resolving power but it it's if if you'd like to run a small uh, spectrometer experiment it's a nice ccd and along with this jewelers uh spectroscope it's a very good uh, device i would like to give a small pause here to the presentation i would like to show uh this spectrometer i mean remains of this spectrometer because we try to we try to take out parts of it and try to use it in different experiments so i am stopping here and coming back to the main screen i hope you can see me now so just the light as well so this is the one uh, mini jewelers used to examine the gemstones uh, in their jewelry store it is it has uh, most likely a prism uh, two prisms or more, two or more prisms although they sell as diffraction based grating but i don't believe this is the diffraction based grating i don't know if you can see the colors no yeah yeah you yeah, can see the colors here so yeah that's how uh, it works so by looking through this port you can see the if you see a light bulb a cfl light you can see a, a clear distinct lines or if you look at a led or a um, tungsten lamp you see a cont continuous spectra How does it actually work? What does it have inside? How does it actually work? What does it have inside? Uh, it has the prism, uh, two or three prisms. I'll I'll show insides of this in a slide. Um, I mean, there are two types of them. I uh, but I will show one of the types. So this is the one which I was showing in the slide with the nucleo and this spectroscope going here, and this is the CCD. You can see, I think, the, the Toshiba CCD. uh i bought it for 4 dollars i think in mauser so although it it was said in a thesis uh, 15 dollars but one can buy for 4 dollars and i would like to give here some break and i would like to ask audience if anybody walk with this kind of uh, ccd or this kind of spectroscope before uh back in the day i i, I used a perkin elmer uh, spectrometer they're pretty expensive though in comparison okay okay 
Yeah, I didn't give the price for this one. It, it is around twenty dollars. I mean, depends on where you buy. Uh, but there is a smaller version of it as well. I will show that as well uh, as I progress in the presentation. So I'll be going back to the presentation before going back to the presentation. If anybody has any questions, please ask now. Or raise your hands. Otherwise, I will go back to the presentation. Okay, I am going back to the presentation. You can write the questions also in chat box. Uh, you know, here in the Zoom. So now, coming back to the presentation, this is what I showed. Uh, it's a very nice uh, setup uh, if you would like to just learn about the spectrometer and all. But let me see. It's not going to the next slide. Oh uh, yeah. Ocean Optics also released a small spectral sensor. Uh, it is still in hundreds of euros. Uh, it can be used for the multispectral imaging, particularly mounting on drones uh, kind of applications. Then um, this is another interesting spectrometer from Ocean Optics. It's very portable if you can recognize this is a Raspberry Pi. And if you see the comparison of the sizes, it's very, very small. Um, I try to use that, uh, particularly UV version of this uh, ocean optic spectrometer to measure some proteins and DNA, uh, you know, IPA, just to make sure, just to make use of this in a nano drop kind of device. I think many of you will relate to the nano drop because that's one of the most widely used spectrometer in the labs in in many biology labs I come across at least. Bec uh, I'll present about that also a small demo, uh, which is not in its original form again. Uh, but this is the STS spectrophotometer, and this is an open version of open source NanoDrop. Uh, this open, so open source NanoDrop was originally made by Hacteria Group. Um, it works with the princip similar principle like uh, real NanoDrop. You know, you have a um, instead of tungsten, uh, sorry. Uh, deuterium lamp source, they replace that with LED and light guide, uh, and then it's reflected from mirror and a grating and a camera. In original nano drop, this spectrometer was a ocean optic spectrometer. So I thought rather than this DA version completely, why don't I use STS uh, spectrometer? It kind of fits the bill as I, uh, as I shown here, the, you know, size is very, very, you know, within the limits of um, this uh, DA version, but I haven't made it completely. And this is very interesting. If you ever saw um, this Biohackers Netflix series, in, in the first episode at 20 minutes, you can see this device. It's very popular, but I think uh, it is not yet completed by anybody. Um, if you ever made this, uh, also let me know. I would like to show how it looks like, uh, you know, the, the uh, CNC, uh, sorry, laser cut parts. I'll stop the presentation. And again, I would like to show uh, the parts that that makes this. It's like laser cut parts. You can just screw it together um, into a, you know, box. It's relatively very, cheap, very easy to assemble it. Um, I think what would be best is the 3D printed version of it. Many people trying to do that. I never saw anybody sharing their design files, um, but it's a very good one. Uh, if if you would like to do nano drop type of spectrometer, this is a very good design. Anybody attempted nano drop style? I think Jenny, at one point you try to do. Yeah, we had a group of students working, but um, one of the challenges with the with the nano drop that you just showed is that it's not actually a U. So most nano drops do UV range, and they're yeah. actually pretty far into deep UVC, so very 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 small wavelengths, um, yeah. and that is difficult. I mean, you can get UV LEDs for sure, but um, doing the spec across to here is like 230, 260 and 280 nanometers is challenging. So we did have a project. Unfortunately, the pandemic meant all the students had to, <laughs> to leave and kind of the project collapsed a little bit, but yeah. we might try and revive it this year. But UV, well, as soon as you get into deep UVC, it's really hard because everything has to be UV compatible and then yeah. it starts getting expensive. 
Yes. Uh, so I think uh, this STS UV might be a good option. I don't know if, if you looked into it, but it's just $400, I think. I mean, it's still expensive solution. It's, it's not expensive. Within, <laughs> yeah. For researchers, maybe in the developer countries might not be a problem, but this is the only possible uh, way of getting it done. I think uh, for me, uh, that can truly work in a similar fashion to original nanodrop. Maybe if you can get really hold of a uh, good UV LEDs, then you can get it as well, you know, with a broad uh, photo. Broad yeah, photo. we found a mini, a mini Xenon flash lamp, um, yeah. which we just managed to find some cheap ones, but um, they were, they were sort of like someone was just selling them on eBay. Normally they're quite expensive. And then we had a, we had a, a proper linear, um, I'm going to say CCD, but I can't actually remember, but it was a linear sensor from Hamamatsu. So it definitely, we were not doing, we were trying to replicate the function <laughs> rather than keep the costs kind of really, really, really low. Yeah. Um, and for context, I mean, nano drops are anything from like 4,000 pounds upwards. So, yeah. so that's not, even if you can do it for a thousand, it's still helpful for, for some labs. Yes. What does the drop refer to? Uh, drop, I will show that in the presentation actually. <laughs> okay. So I think I went out of the presentation mode. Sorry. Yeah, okay, I'm here. So the drop is this drop, actually, you can put a small drop of, I mean, micro volume of your original liquid, and it will form when these two, uh, you know, uh, pedestal they call, uh, it will form like a small water column between these two pedestals. That, because it can do spectrometry and a small drop, a small volume of liquid, it is very popular. So you don't waste much of your um, costly reagents or you know bio solutions. Um, although um, nano drop, uh, may, uh, the guys in the nano nano drop says that uh, it is patented and all. It is not patent. The patent has been expired. Um, but not only that. Uh, there are earlier patents on that uh, on micro volume spectrometers. That's why there are many knockoffs you can find in eBay and different countries. Although 4000 Jenny said for the original nano drop, there are uh, commercial nano drop style uh, devices you can buy for 1000, 1500. I saw them, uh, some of them, but they are not reliable. Even the original nano drop is sometimes called as a random number generator. Okay, I'll not speak about much about, I'll not speak much about that. Now, going to Hamamatsu mini spectral sensors. Uh, these are very, very interesting. Uh, these are still hundreds of euros, uh, 120 euros around. One can buy in group gets. Uh, there are many research papers published based on this spectral sensor. One of them is this recent uh, paper in Hardware X. Uh, somebody took this mini spectrometer and paired it with a uh, Arduino Nano on Bluetooth and you can put all of them together in a 3D printed box. You can get the spectra onto smartphone. Very useful uh, for some experiments if you are measuring one by one. And this is, uh, Jenny sent me some slides about single pixel cameras. And again, you can see this breakout board one can get from the group gets. It's not just bare sensor, it's uh, with the breakout board. Bear sensor itself, I was quoted around 120 euros by Hamamatsu. I don't know its real price, uh, what you can get for. But with the breaker board, I think it's 150, 120 euros. Um, I, I didn't see recently, but in the order of uh, hundreds of dollars or euros. And one can use this to make, uh, again, mul uh, multi-spectral imaging. Uh, this is one of the application. And this is hugely popular paper uh, in scientific reports. Uh, it was in back in 2016. They made a, uh, a group at MIT. They, I think they, they made very handheld spectral sensor using this Hamamatsu uh, chip. Again, pairing with Arduino and Bluetooth. Uh, as you can see here, there is a light that uh, flashes the light onto the sample and reflected light is measured by this Hamamatsu sensor. This is, uh, what they measured, you know, ripeness of fruits using this uh, handheld sensor. Quite, quite cheap and, you know, compared to the existing solutions and very portable. When we are here, I would like to introduce about CO handheld sensors because uh, these are also one of the commercially successful um, handheld sensor as far as I know. Um, not the company-wise or the, their sales and revenue, 
which might be a different story, but the, they, they gathered very widespread uh, coverage in the mainstream media as well, in you know, tech blogs and electronic um, gadget blogs. They are based on similar um, device uh, previously we used in our lab, uh, tel, uh, Telspec. Um, it, it has a small sensor and a light, uh, you know, small spectral sensor and a light and just one button interface. So similarly, CO also has this kind of um, interface, just one button you press and point it towards a sample what you would like to measure and in onto your smartphone you get you get the not the spectra but what it is the material and the contents in it i'll tell a little bit story about it why i didn't say the entire uh, spectra you don't get it they they are so popular they are also at one point uh, released a spectral sensor for smartphone as you can see uh, this is the spectral sensor in this in the smartphone but they are not cheap. They are not low cost solution one, you know, to discuss here in this, in this talk. But I think eventually at one point when they come along with smartphone, it will be cheaper. Uh, so the researcher edition uh, is $4,000 because you can get the raw spectra. If you don't pay $4,000, if you pay only $3,000, you can get what is inside a uh, sample like a fruit or something, uh, but not the spectra. You cannot download the spectra. I would because many people, many of you are curious um, hackers or makers. I would like to present here the tear down of this uh, device done by uh, Sparkfun. Uh, this is the device and this is the lipo battery, and you can see the tight integration of many electronic parts. This is the light engine, uh, the main uh, brain of this chip. As you can see here, uh, these are the filters, you know, like AMS spectra, which uh, Richard will be covering soon. Uh, it is also based on a similar technology. Behind this uh, spectral fil uh, filter is a CCD, and this is the illumination light, and these are the micro lenses uh, that focus the light onto the CCD. Very, very clever uh, miniaturization. They could not meet their a Kickstarter campaign, a target within the time because of this miniaturization struggles. Um, but I think now they are selling uh, different versions of it. Um, now, I will be coming back to the AMS spectral sensors, uh, the filter space spectral sensors very briefly, just for the completeness. I know you will hear a lot more about it soon. Um, in Hackaday, you can buy them uh, at Tindy store for $25, these uh, spectral sensors. Each one of these three spectral sensors from um, AMS covers six channels. So total, they cover 18 channels from visible to near infrared. And again, you can pack them nicely in a small 3D printed box. Uh, you can get everything done for less than $100. Very low cost solution for biologists. But be careful, uh, one of the important parts of these uh, filters based spectral sensors is they see other colors in the channels where they're not supposed to see. For example, if you see a channel 550 nanometers, you are supposed to see only 550 nanometers wavelength of light, but you also see 570 nanometers of light here as well. Again, at 570 uh, channel, you get to see some 550 nanometers light. And around 600, this problem is again uh, huge. Similarly, in their another uh, spectral sensor as well, uh, you can see the overlapping of colors. Filter-based spectral sensors, although they, they are low cost um, route to uh, get miniaturization and everything, they are not perfect in my view. Um, one should be careful while using them in their design. I would, like to, I would like to just make that cautionary note. Then before going to the smartphone spectrometers, I would like to give a short break. Again, I would like to ask audience if they have uh, used any of these kind of AMS spectral sensors apart from Richard, you know? No? Okay. I, I remember having used the, the ocean optics, but for UBB measurements, we were trying to characterize um, something we were using for stress plants. And I remember it was, it was quite, uh, it was quite nice at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, good to hear about this. 
okay if there yeah. are no further questions i would like to go back to the presentation and it's like a break <laughs> if anybody would like to interact and would like to ask any questions uh, what happened so far um it's the time but can i ask about using the white light leds uh, yeah coming from a physics background i would have thought a sort of black body white light was ideal and i'm assuming that white light leds aren't that close to a black body spectrum yes uh, that's true uh you are quite right about it and that's why the um, osram uh, leds they they are kind of color compensated i think the ones used in the i'll, I'll go back to the presentation to show it has some a lot uh, you know let me get it back to this sorry i want this yeah this is not quite white led it's broad spectral uh, emission sometimes they pay two uh, leds not just one led to compensate for that black body radiation and many times you don't need perfect black body illumination if you know uh, if you are doing the base calibration and it's a very nice question actually i, I need to uh, tell this you know co has a cap actually the cap around it has a white reflective material first you need to do baseline correction with that and then you can measure any other um, spectra so yeah so, sometimes you we need to play these kind of tricks to get get around this problem it's a nice question and i guess in many ways you don't actually want black body radiation anyway because that's yes. very low at one end of the spectrum you know, it's yeah usually yeah by the red yeah and it's also hard to get a black body kind of uh, light emitting source cheaply there used to be tungsten sources uh, i'll come back to one of the slide uh, where you see still that kind of black body radiation because uh, in near infrared spectrum it is very rare to get um, broadband emitting leds so uh, actually texas instrument managed to build a small handheld uh, spectrometer near infrared spectrometer where they use this kind of uh, halogen or tungsten lamp okay now coming back to the smartphone spectrometers another way to achieve the low cost spectrometry is through using the sensors uh, image sensors in the spectrometer in, in the smartphones there are many versions of it uh, i reviewed some of them in my blog uh, but i don't want to go into detail i would like to just very fairly uh, touch them people used different dispersive elements before the camera of a smartphone to get a nice spectra it this idea is highly popularized by public labs actually they sell this kind of 7 dollar or you know 5 dollar foldable um, uh, cardboard sheet type thing you can buy and you can fold it and attach to a smartphone along with a small transmission uh, diffraction uh, element you get very nice spectra uh, it's good for the purpose of you know education and all this but for real measurements i think people struggle with that um i try to make similar version as well uh, myself as i shown before with a jewelers uh, spectrometer uh, spect spectroscope tube and my version allows want to put a cuvette and light source i will show it in a minute but before going back to there i would like to mention that it's, it's huge you know when we attach this tube to the smartphone it's heavy later i found out that there is a smaller version of it it's only 5 dollars this spectroscope type um as you can see here it's my old very 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 old phone it still get, um impressive spectra was captured from this i would like to show this uh, although there is no charge but i would like to just um show briefly stop and you can see my hand and Okay, I'll remove this one as well. Okay, okay. I would like to just give the uh, just glimpse of the sizes involved. Um, as you can see, it's a three D printed attachment. Uh, one can keep like a snug fit, and this is where the spectra comes. I think I can still show the spectra from this one as well. the spectra no okay 
maybe <laughs> it's not possible maybe this time um but yeah it it snugly fits into um, a smartphone um it's very easy just one 3d printed part but if you would like to attach a fiber optic you can put uh, another uh, adapter i would like to remove that adapter with the force so this is the uh, the tube i'm uh, the tube i'm talking about and then we have you can put a little adapter 3d printed adapter for the fiber and you can uh, really fix it uh, or you can you can also put a little another uh, module a 3d printed module for the um, cuvet i would like to show that as well give me a sec So this is the place for the keyword. This is to control the LED brightness and there is a LED inside it um, with the glue I fixed. Ideally it goes like this. Um, if, if you can print nicely, you don't need this much tube length. Um, so, one can again measure the spectral, uh, you know, spectral information from the samples like environmental samples. I just discussed one of that application, especially for the water quality monitoring. Did you guys come across any uh, smartphone based spectrometers in any tech blog or something like that, like public labs? It was very popular actually. I think Jenny, you introduced us to them, didn't you? Oh, we built them in Science Makers. Yes. Yeah, we had the, one of the Science Makers. I don't, I, I guess the theme was maybe Spectratus. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Yeah, we had, um, we had two sort of formal, like I, I basically ordered two of the public lab spectra for Thomas's, the desktop ones. And then we yeah. all had to go at the folding one with the CD grating. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think also we ran an event in Make Space for the Science Festival one year, or maybe, it, I think it was a science festival, the art science soiree. Um, mm -hmm. And we had, or was it, or family science makers maybe, at least two events I've done. I remember using the um, the vinyl cutter to make yeah. like foldable spectrophotometer. Um, yeah, yeah. On a smartphone. Yeah. It's very really nice actually. The vinyl cutter, but it's quite tedious. It takes ages to cut through all the, the um, cut out all of the cardboard things. Shapes. The difficult part is extracting the grating from DVD. Mm -hmm. Uh, many people don't realize it. Uh, it's better to buy from eBay the transmission grating that just actually very cheap, like two, three euros. Yeah. And, yeah. and also, who's got blank CDs anymore? I actually wanted to do that. <laughs> At some point over lockdown, I needed some grating and I wanted to see if a CD would work. And I realized I don't I don't have any. And I chucked yeah. out the ones that I did have because I'm, like, I'm never going to use these. <laughs> actually, you better have DVDs. They're almost more expensive than the, the actual gratings are these exactly. days. Exactly. They are more expensive than just buying the grating off of eBay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but anybody who would like to run that kind of workshops, uh, Edmund Optics sells very big sheets of these uh, thousand lines per inch uh, uh, gratings, transmission gratings. So you can cut them into small pieces uh, as you want. Um, yeah, it's cost effective that way. So now, I mean, I'm coming back to spectrophotometers. Um, this should be the main focus of my talk. Then in spectrophotometers, uh, how they're a little different than spectrometers is that we try to send the light through prism or dispersal element like a, uh, I, was, I have been telling so far, but we select only one color to pass through a small narrow slit. And that one color, uh, you know, small band of colors pass through the absorbing liquid uh, and you monitor the intensity of that one color. It quite, kind of simplifies the design because you don't need big CCD, you just need a photodiode. And many cases you can just replace all these with small LED because LEDs these days are quasi monochromatic. That means they emit in very narrow band. So based on this principle, many hackers and makers try to make this kind of cheap uh, spectrophotometers. If you see this Hacterian, Hackerian, uh, they try to make it. You, you can see here small green LED and a photoresistor, I think. Um, 
here there's a pink solution that absorbs the green light. They tried to make this kind of kits and they produced a PCB board. They sold widely, I think, you know, hundreds of um, quantities. Then there is a Hackerium also. They also made a similar uh, device with uh, Arduino, as you can see here at Mega. And they also try to do, um, try to use a LED. The, this design is quite popular. And although I'll be speaking about those designs, I would like to come back to uh, smartphone based spectrophotometers here. They also try to use again smartphones screen, but this time try to uh, not try to put any dispersal element and also try to use the light, uh, you know, LED flashlight in many smartphones to send the uh, light into the camera through this cubit. So, for example, the light on, a, uh, on an iPhone flashlight flashes here and reflects, 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 and goes through this cubit. Uh, there's a good PhD thesis on this. Uh, I suggest if anybody is trying to do these kind of things to read this, they explain very well how to take data from different channels of um, uh, CCD on the smartphone because smartphone cameras have this RGB, uh, you know, RGB photodiodes on the on the on their CCD. Only few depending on the solution uh, few and few photodiodes you can you can see the color for example uh, here red uh, channel doesn't see any change in the liquid but blue and green saw a huge change so for different type of liquids depending on their color you need to choose which color of uh, which color channel you would like to use in the ccd by uh, going through a small by going through a small uh, weighted average function, you can really calculate the in this application pH, but similar kind of, you know, up, uh, for example, water quality monitoring for nitrates, phosphates, all these can be achieved with smartphones. A similar technique has been used for measuring the urine samples, you know, different diseases in, use, in urine. Uh, again, measuring the RGB channels on a smartphone, you know, here. The idea is that there is this, there is a uh, strip of uh, you know small small bands and you dip it into the urine and put it again as a uh, color pattern a standardized color pattern and take the photo and compare the the, the color changes with respect to these uh, with respect to these standard colors and similar technique is now used for the um, COVID-19 detection, people are proposing. You have a 96 well plate reader and take a picture of that and you know compare the color intensities. It, it can work by you know monitoring the three color channels in smartphone camera, but there are some issues, you know, um, those are for the details. We also try to use this kind of device. Uh, for one of the ISM projects, I collaborated with uh, IN, uh, or they collaborated with WAMSI in UCC here, and we tried to make. Um, here you can see a bright orange light because we used the orange LED. Um, I would like to show that, uh, show that device. So this is our smartphone based spectrophotometer. Um, I think there is light, yeah. As you can see here, there is an orange light coming out, you know, the light is leaking out of the device because it's not printed in black, but in white. Um, also, we also kept a blue light as well. I think blue light is even uh, brighter. You can put a, uh, like a PCR tube here uh, in, into the hole and you monitor the screen uh, you know, for the RGB color channels. I'll show that on the presentation screen, but it's quite a uh, little device. It was used for one of the ISM uh, competition. I think there is charge in it, but it's not, um, not working. So I can't show the same screen, which I showed in the presentation. Yeah, as you can see here, there is a color app on the iPhone and Android. You can download 
that can that can monitor the three channels rgb channels on a camera and it should not be like this bright you know you need to introduce some filter to or you need to control the brightness uh, to get real color and if you keep on you know putting the tubes with different colors uh, depending on the color absorbing power of these solutions you can see the changes in these rgb color channels it's very nice experiments you don't need even uh, this kind of smartphone attachments there is a nice youtube video on how to do it uh, with color solutions in a small plastic you know transparent cups and it it can be a nice good uh, experiment for the schools now i'm coming to the bacterial growth monitoring i think this is most interesting for the biologist who are working on wet labs uh, i come across this problem because of from say uh, by closely observing many biologists i found out that biologist takes this kind of you know bacteria and put it in a tube and put it in a shaking incubator and they take every Uh, they go every 20 minutes and take small sample out of it and go to the fume hood and put that into a small cuvette and then measure its optical density and they repeat this 8 to 10 times while doing so there is a problem you know risk of contamination and they lose some sample and you need to use this plastics and you know this kind of uh, plastic waste and every time you use this kind of device you know when you need to sam take a sam some sample out you need to use the fume hood that contributes to the huge power wastage so we thought is there someone who has done this already to solve this problem yeah there are many people who try to do this solve this problem and you can see the complicated way of arranging the electronics there is again just it requires small led and a light detector and a microprocessor like arduino uh and with bluetooth or wifi and rechargeable battery and that's it people can really get the bacterial growth curve in life but it looks very very clumsy for me so i looked in the literature there are other people who try to do this um, people uh, in it, it's one of the diy device uh, you can find it in the bio archive and they try to launch the kickstarter as well you can still buy it for 500 dollars or you know 1000 uh, dollars depending on you want to buy assembled or uh, just the parts and there are other examples in the literature but these are all not portable according to me and these are very complicated way of solving a problem at the time i was hacking fitness trackers my main object at the time was uh, robotics as you can see here this is a small bristle boat and it's a fitness tracker i hope i can run the video now okay um ideally there should be a video uh, this bristle boat walks maybe i will show that later and slowly i, I was gaining confidence and i was uh, hacking internals of the smartphone i was finally displaying my own clock uh oh it is working yeah sorry so you can see here i'll show a uh, 3d printed part now uh, in a while so these are the internals of a fitness tracker it has all the components required for example uh, the rechargeable battery arduino processor i mean a processor that can be controlled with arduino as an rf um and also very good photodiode and tra um, the trans amplifier all these parts nicely packed in 25 dollar or less device so we gained access access to this device because the uh, many of these chinese makers who make this they give very clear um, pinouts for the run, dumping our own from from where so it's it's not too difficult as i shown here you know you can see the clear markings for rx tx and you uh, sw clock and all these connections so the important bit is this one the heart rate sensor the heart rate sensor has usually two leds two green leds and a photo photo detector this photo detector is not just one photo detector it has two visible photodiode and infrared photodiode 
So what we try to do is that we try to do the optical density monitoring with this device. So optical density is traditionally measured at 600 nanometers. So we removed the vibration motor and instead there we connected a uh, 600 nanometer LED and we kept it in a 3D printed uh, enclosure and we kept the falcon tube here. And we made some experiments. Initially, our prototype looked so ugly as you can see here, but it worked. So we went on measuring some bacterial growth curves of these three um, bacteria and we published in analytical chemistry. This is kind of a representative figure that caught the eyes of many, um, many people, mainly biologists on Twitter. I'll come back to that in a while. But what we saw is, this is the traditional way, uh, what, we sh what I sh explained previously, but with our device, you just keep it, you see how small it is in the, in the incubator and you get the values live onto the, onto the smartphone. So it is continuous monitoring, no, uh, no need to open the seal of your tube that might cause the uh, contamination. So you can get all the data into smartphone, no special consumables or plastic required, no risk of contamination. As I mentioned previously, I, when we published this, there was a huge um, response on the Twitter. People would like to just take my money and give, give us a device. We still get these requests on email. So we try to make uh, even more better device, uh, including not just optical instruments, but also flow sense measurements. The advantages of this fitness tracker based device is you can get these uh, fitness sensors just for $10 or $20, depends on where you buy, what brand you buy. There are many fitness sensors these days available. They are just made for hacking uh, with ESP32 or NRF52 chips. These are There are many people who are hacking these devices actively. There is a very good group in uh, Gitter. My point is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel to make miniaturize this optical density meter. You can use already miniaturized device and just make use of the uh, parts and carefully write the uh, firmware. We are trying to make it better, um, but not using entirely the fitness tracker, but uh, parts of it. And nowadays, fitness trackers are coming with different sensors, for example, you know, GPS sensor, humidity, pressure, temperature, accelerometer, these are all can be used um, for various applications in biology. For example, if we can make use of GPS, you can note down where you took the sample when you take this device onto a field uh, deployment, you can uh, encode the GPS coordinates along with your um, measurements. Similarly, the temperature, pressure, and humidity at the place might not be accurate, but might give some clues. So my idea is that these fitness trackers can be very useful genetic biosensors for, you know, for example, like water quality measuring. So we are trying to publish another paper on this, uh, particularly pH monitoring, uh, or nitrates, or phosphates. These are all just based on the um, internal LED of the fitness tracker. So in that case, we don't need to add even an extra LED. We use everything inside the fitness tracker, fitness tracker salon. We think that these kind of photometers are quite useful for the bioreactors. For example, these are the two examples I picked up from the uh, Hexter. Uh, so in this bioreactor, you can see uh, one of the function of this flow through photometries to measure the uh, turbidity or the cell density. So in these places, we can easily put the fitness tracker device. It's quite smaller than the existing solutions proposed. You don't need to assemble anything. You just need to flash the code. In many cases, you don't even need to open the fitness trackers. They allow you to do the on, uh, you know, OTA update on their update. So this is another bioreactor I come across. So they use the AMS spectral sensor, but again, uh, in all these complicated bioreactors, maybe we can uncomplicate a little bit by using the already miniaturized uh, fitness tracker based devices. So here I would like to give a small pause and I think 
I don't, I didn't look at the time, but I would like to know how I'm doing with the time. Uh, based on that, I would like to go further. Uh, 20 minutes left, Jeanette, which would include also Richard's talk. Uh, so, so, okay, I, I think better I stop here. Maybe if there is time left, uh, I, I kind of spoke everything, uh, most of the things I would like to speak. So I would like to give to Richard and I can come back if there is time left. Um, and are, have you got a hard stop at nine or can you hang around in Zoom if people have extra questions? Yeah, I, I, I have time, you know, I can always hang around. Okay, can you see the, uh, the slide? Yes. Great. Yeah, so I'm Richard Hopper, I'm a researcher at the university, also a consultant. And I used to work for AMS. Um, I'm not doing this uh, to boost my shares, but <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, AMS, obviously a, a leader in, in optical uh, miniature sensors. So um, I thought um, you might be interested in learning more about, the, about these chip-based sensors. Um, so um, I suppose there's no need to really go over stuff that uh, Chin has been over. Um, but um, yeah, most of the, the fundamental uh, frequencies um, for spectroscopy are in the, uh, the mid-IR spectrum, so um, between three and 50 micrometers. Um, however, it's very difficult to, to sense in this, this region uh, using low-cost um, sensors because uh, you need quite specialist detectors which have exotic materials which, uh, which are quite high cost. Um, fortunately, there's harmonics or, or overtones which uh, exist at short wavelengths, so uh, in the visible and uh, UV and uh, near IR, which are easier to detect using low cost detectors, so uh, silicon photodiodes, for example. And it's possible to integrate these onto CMOS chips to create very small uh, low cost devices. Um, so, so yeah, um, a CMOS um, sensor um, consists of a, a chip, obviously, um, and then that has an array of um, photodiodes on it. Um, and then it's possible to uh, deposit a, an optical filter um, directly onto the, onto the chip. Um, and these filters are, are typically interference-based uh, filters, and they consist of a, a number of them different layers. Uh, and then we have some uh, electronics um, in the chip itself. So we um, have our photodiode, uh, obviously. Um, and then we have a, an amplifier, um, which converts the, the current into a, into a voltage. Uh, and then we have uh, an ADC uh, in order to, to digitize the, the voltage and generate our, our digital signal. Um, and then typically we have some um, additional interface um, electronics uh, to, allow, to allow you to connect this thing to a, a CPU. Um, and so we have a, a diagram of the, uh, of the chip based sensor there. So you can see the, the CMOS chip, which is, is mounted into a, a package with our filter on top. And then we have uh, an aperture to uh, allow light onto the, onto the chip, onto the detector. Uh, and these chips are are tiny, so um, uh, typically less than a couple of millimeters square. Um, and you can see a, an image on the on the lower right of the, the screen through the, the aperture of one of these chips, uh, and you can see the uh, array of um, photodiodes with the with the filters on top for different um, different wavelengths. Um, so AMS has a number of um, different types of uh, chip base. Uh, sensors. So um, two of the most popular ones are the AS7262 uh, uh, and 63. Um, and these are, uh, are visible and near IR sensors, the uh, six channel uh, sensors. So um, um, they cover from the, the near UV uh, up to the up to the red region. Um, and uh, for the visible sense of the, um, the bandwidth um, if you like, is around uh, 40 nanometers um, for each of these each of these channels, uh, and then we have the, the near IR sensor, the, the 63, 
Um, and that uh, again has six, six channels and the bandwidth of each one is around uh, 20 nanometers. Uh, and these chips um, share a number of, of features. So um, they both have a, a multiplexer in order to, to read out the, um, the different uh, elements on the, on the chip. Uh, and then there's a, an amplifier um, with adjustable gain. Um, so you can uh, compensate, um, for example, if you have low light intensity, so you can, you can boost the, the gain to compensate. Um, they both have 16-bit um, uh, ADC, so um, you can get pretty high uh, resolution. Um, the integration time, which is the, the time to, to make a, a full set of measurements, um, is typically on the order of uh, 200 to, uh, to 500 milliseconds. Um, these chips also uh, incorporate um, LED drivers, so um, I believe you can drive um, LEDs up to 100 uh, milliamps. Um, if you want to drive higher power LEDs, well, you have to use a, um, a separate driver circuit. Um, and there is a, an interrupt uh, pin on these chips, so um, you can interface to, a, to for example, a, a MOSFET switch. Um, and then these chips obviously have a, an interface um, to, the, to a microcontroller, so uh, you can either use uh, a UART interface or I2C, which is a, a two-wire serial interface. Um, they're factory calibrated, um, so there is compensation uh, for the fact that um, you have different responsivities uh, depending on the, on the wavelength which is sensed. Um, so you can see the, uh, the spectral response of the, the 63, the visible sensor, and also the, uh, the 62 sensor. Um, so that these plots show the, uh, the spectral response for the, uh, for the different channels. Um, you can see they're the fairly uh, narrow band, um, but as Chile was, was saying, there is some, some overlap uh, between the, the channels um, in this case. So you can see, for example, for the visible sense of the, the green and the purple uh, channels overlap. So it is something obviously uh, you need to, to take into account when you're uh, designing your, your system. And um, remember that there's going to be some mutual coupling between the channels. Um, AMS also have um, the AS7341, which uh, is a more up-to-date uh, visible and near IR sensor. So this is uh, 11 channel sensor in, in total. Um, and there's eight uh, visible channels. And uh, you can see uh, on the slide uh, a plot showing the, uh, the responsivity for, for the channels. And the visible channels are fairly uh, evenly distributed uh, for this sensor. Um, there is some overlap, but it's not, it's not too severe, I suppose. Um, and then you have uh, an additional channel in the, in the near IR, uh, but this is only a, a, single, a single channel, so um, it's no good really for, for spectral sensing in, in the near IR unless you want just a, a single channel measurement. Um, another fact uh, is that the, the responsivity is not, is not uniform, so um, you can see at the, the edge of the spectrum, for example, um, towards the, the UV and the, the near IR, the, the responsivity does, uh, does tend to drop off. Um, so if you're, you're making uh, measurements in, in these regions, uh, you really need a, a higher power uh, light source in order to, to compensate for that drop off in, in responsivity. Um, there's also an 18 uh, channel sensor. Um, this is really a, a cheat because it's uh, three chips which are connected together. Um, so you have this, um, this master chip, um, this uh, AS72651 chip, and then you have the, the other two uh, chips as well, the, uh, the 52 and the 53. Um, so these are for, for different uh, wave bands. So uh, covering from the, from the near UV, so from 410 nanometers up to, uh, to 690 nanometers. Um, and the, the bandwidth uh, for each of these, these channels is, is pretty narrow, so uh, only around uh, 20 nanometers. 
So you can see here a, a slide showing the, uh, the spectral uh, response. This is the, uh, the normalized spectral response. Um, as I mentioned, obviously you're going to get uh, a drop off in the, in the responsivity uh, towards the, the edges of the, the bands. Um, you can see the, the channels are, are pretty evenly um, space out and um, in fact there's there's quite little uh, overlap with the, uh, with the response uh, responses in, in this case uh, but this is a, a higher cost um, solution so um, I think um, boards with these sensors they typically retail for for over 60 pounds but um, that, that's really I suppose not bad, bad value you know, considering the, uh, the number of channels um, yeah, the, so these uh, these optical uh, filters which are on these these chips, um, they're pretty stable, um, um, so they don't drift that much with with temperature. Um, one thing you have to be aware about is there is some uh, angular dependence. Um, so if you have a, a light source which is uh, coming off coming in off sensor off, off center, then uh, that will, will shift the, um, the spectral response, so it's something to be, be aware about. Um, so how do we uh, illuminate these, these sensors? Uh, well, we can, of course, use LED light sources. Um, these, these are narrow bands sources by, by nature, um, so they're based on, on the fact that electrons transfer from uh, one energy state to, to another and uh, we get a resonance effect, so um, obviously narrow band. Um, we can make them broader band by integrating uh, phosphors. Um, so uh, typically you have a, an LED um, which has a, a short uh, wavelength and then you have a, a phosphor uh, to generate a, a longer set of wavelengths. So you can make them, make them warmer. Um, you can see on the, the plot on the on the slide, there's a plot in the center for a, a warm LED, which is a, a phosphor coated LED. Uh, but you can, you can see that the, um, uh, the, the spectra isn't, uh, isn't flat by, by any means, so um, you still get a, a characteristic peak. Um, in this case, um, um, someone's used uh, multiple LEDs, so a warm LED with a phosphor and then uh, a couple of other narrowbands LEDs in order to uh, illuminate one of the multispectral sensors. I um, should mention that um, the spectral uh, intensity of, of LEDs and the, the wavelength uh, can shift um, quite dramatically with, uh, with ambient temperature. Um, so, for example, if the temperature in, in the room changes, you can get a, a shift in the in the response uh, and also as the device is, is warming up um, so these LEDs might uh, take a few minutes to, to warm up so it's just something to be, be warned about. Um, halogen bulbs are, are another um, alternative um, as was mentioned before if you want a, a broadband source but um, obviously not as uh, compact typically as, uh, as an LED and not as uh, robust. Um, so there's a range of uh, modules with, uh, with the mul these multispectral sensors on. Um, so uh, SparkFun um, have, uh, I think, three modules for the, the 62 and the, the 63 devices, so the, the visible and the, the near IR, uh, and also for the 18-channel the uh, device, so the, um, the three uh, sensor chips. Um, the advantage with the, the SparkFun uh, boards is that they, they have these quick connectors, um, so they, they make it very easy uh, to wire up to a, a microcontroller uh, using their uh, interface. Um, Pimeroni uh, also have a, a board for the, the 62 um, sensor. Um, you have to wire that up uh, using individual uh, connections, but uh, it's not particularly difficult to do that. Um, and also um, Adafruit, they have a couple of boards as well for the, the 62 um, and also the, uh, the 10 channel uh, sensor as well. Um, and these are pretty reasonable costs. So um, uh, for the 
for the census with a lower number of channels, uh, typically around 20 pounds. And then for the, uh, the free sensor combo, an 18 channel um, device, that's uh, 65 pounds. Um, then in terms of um, interfacing, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can connect up the, uh, the boards using uh, individual wires. Um, for example, this is the, the connections for uh, the Adafruit's board. Um, but um, for I, I2C, you will need a couple of wires, so it's fairly, fairly trivial. And of course, you have the, the power connections. Um, Spark from do may make an interface, so you can actually uh, interface those those boards to a, a USB uh, connection. Uh, so you can see their, their interface for the 18 channel uh, sensor board. And as I mentioned, um, they have the, uh, the quick connectors um, as well, uh, which make it very easy uh, to wire up the boards and you can parallel them as well. Um, it's really it's really just an I2C interface, but uh, obviously it's a bit, a bit easier to do the, the wiring. There's lots of um, firmware and software support um, for these uh, multispectral sensor chips. Um, so Adafruit have libraries, Sparkfun also have libraries and uh, Heroni have libraries. Um, there's more libraries for the Arduino, but um, I see there are a couple of libraries for, for the Python um, if you want to interface to, to that. Um, and most of these, these libraries are, are compatible between uh, boards, which is uh, which is a good thing. Um, yes, I've come across um, a few applications uh, for these sensors, which uh, people have published. So um, this is a, an application which is uh, published on Indestructibles. Um, so in this case, someone's used the uh, the sixty-two sensor, the six-channel visible sensor, uh, and they've created this um, Cavet uh, uh, spectrometer. Um, so uh, they used a, a warm LED to do the illumination uh, and then they have this, this simple uh, 3D printed fixture uh, into which the Cavette slots uh, and then they've got the liquid in that and then they have the, um, uh, the board, the also sensor board mounted on the, on the back and uh, you can see some uh, measurements they've got there showing the uh, intensity with the different food dyes so for the, for the red food dye, obviously that's passing the longer wavelengths. So this is a, a fairly simple application. Um, I've also come across a, a paper from a, a group in uh, Japan who've been looking at uh, uh, detecting the, the ripening of apples. And so monitoring the, uh, the sugar content. Um, so they've, they've used one of these um, uh, spectral sensors to do that. This is the uh, the 18 channel um, device which they've they've used, so the visible and uh, near IR sensor. And so they, they have the multispectral sensor, and then they have these uh, pillars onto which the uh, the apple was was placed. Uh, and then they illuminated the uh, the setup with the uh, halogen bulbs, um, so uh, pretty high power high power bulbs. Um, and then the light was uh, obviously uh, <coughs> uh, went into the apple and then was uh, transferred to the uh, to the sensor. Um, and then they also had a a commercial uh, spectrometer which they were using for a for a comparison. Um, and they were able to to calibrate this uh, this setup with a reflector. Um, so this allowed them to to normalize the uh, the spectral response. Um, so they actually did a, a comparison uh, between the uh, the 18 channel chip and also the, the commercial uh, spectrometer. This was a, a device from Ocean Optics. Um, and you can see they got a, a reasonable um, correlation in terms of the, uh, the absorbance um, across the different, uh, different uh, wave bands. So um, it's really Quite a reasonable correlation there, and obviously the um, the ocean optics um, sensor is um, um, a lot better in terms of the the resolution. But um, still, you know, it's possible to to pick out the uh, the main features um, using the lower cost version. 
Um, they also came up with a, a model. So um, they used uh, multiple uh, linear regression uh, to build a, a model. So um, they're able to um, correlate the um, acidity content, uh, which they measured using a, a meter to the, uh, the, to the response at different, different wavelengths. Um, so they um, determine these uh, correlation factors. Um, so you can see um, there's quite a, a high correlation, uh, for example, between acidity, acidity content and uh, optical response at uh, 530 and uh, 630 nanometers, um, which are related to uh, some pigments in the, in the apple, which uh, correlate with the sugar level. Um, there's also other responses uh, as well relating to, to carbohydrates and, and also water. Um, so they're able to, to build up um, um, quite a good model and um, um, get quite a good um, correlation uh, between the acidity values measured using a, a meter uh, and those uh, measured using the, uh, the multispectral sensor chip. Um, so you, you can see it's pretty impressive the, the correlation which they, they managed to achieve from uh, such a low cost sensor. Um, so yeah, and that was just a, an overview um, of, the, of the AMS chips. Um, so there's obviously a, a, a range of low cost options for, um, for multispectral sensing in the visible and near IR. And uh, it's possible to have a 16 channel setup using uh, multiple chips using three chips. Um, there's good hardware, firmware, software support, uh, as I mentioned. Um, obviously, selection of the illumination source is, is critical for uh, achieving good performance. So you need to be uh, careful in the, in the type of LED that you select and uh, make sure the uh, spectral profile matches the uh, responsivity of your, of your sensor. It's pretty easy, as has been said, to uh, manufacture plastic uh, fixtures for these things using 3D printing. Um, and of course, you can use um, off the shelf um, packages for uh, analyzing the data. Uh, so MATLAB or, or Python packages. And you know, really, applications are just limited by your imagination. Um, so that was a, a quick summary. I don't know if anyone's got any questions. Actually, maybe because we're a bit running out of time, if you can take the Q&A um, or you can carry on as long as you want, but if some people want to leave before, um, you can take the Q&A to the Google group maybe. Um, I just want to say that, yeah, as we're a very recently started group, a biology group, biology club, your uh, input and yeah, your opportunities to participate are very uh, valuable. So I would like to ask if you have any suggestions for future meetings, or if you would like to volunteer to run one of the sessions yourself. Well, thank you to uh, Chinna and Richard for- Yeah, thank you so much. The, the very good talks. Oh, yeah, otherwise these are our communication channels so you can ask them there. And uh, yeah, um, sorry for interrupting them if you want to go back to the q and questions for your talk. I mean, I, I have a quick question. It's, it's all very interesting. I know um, um, the, these sensors are, are based on separate chips in different positions. Um, does that how does that compare to a, a traditional spectrometer where they go to lots of lengths to just have one position it senses from? Um, is, that a, is that a bad thing or is it actually, does it actually have any use cases where that can help? Yeah, it might be a disadvantage, yeah, if you've got separate, separate chips, because, um, yeah, you can't collimate the, the light as, as well on a, a single detector element. So, um, yeah, that might be a disadvantage. Um, I mean, obviously, um, you know, there's further integration with these these chips, and the number of channels is increasing all the time on on a single chip. So, um, yeah. I guess you know, it won't be long and, until we we see 
uh, 18 channel sensors on a on a single chip you know it's just a, a fact of um, scaling up mm -hmm. the, uh, the manufacturing processes um, it's it's mainly the um, the filter technology which is the uh, the limiting factor at the the minutes um, because these optical filters they're quite complex to to produce because you need a quite a, a number of different different layers which have to be very precise thicknesses and you've got to deposit them onto the onto the silicon wafer so it's quite a, a challenging process so um, that's really yeah. limiting the, the number of channels you know it's not the not the actual yeah. uh, the CMOS uh, chip itself it's the limiting factor well, I have, I have some experience in deposition of optical structures and I'm kind of very, very, very sympathetic to the challenges. I mm. think Chinna Chin also explained very carefully that the quality of the filters is a very important element. It may not be something that ultimately affects your results, but you have to know what the quality of your filters are. For, for yeah, yeah, so, so. Uh, uh, exactly. And, you know, as, was, as you know, I mentioned and Chinna mentioned, you know, you can get interference between the different different bands um but yeah having, having said you know technology is improving and um yeah the latest chips they are better in in terms of the, the separation between the the bands and and also they have, have narrower bandwidths yeah. well i imagine that um especially if you're using things like python because I, i've got some mm. friends who are very into data that that if you know what the, the overlap between the channels is there is a lot of scope for understanding you know being able to cope mm. with that as long as i mean the, the the quality issue is not so much well how maybe it is how pure they are but it's also how reliably overlapped if you <laughs> if, oh if yes that's, and, if I mean, that's and you can do statistical analysis on, on this so you can determine can't you you know what the effect is of having having an overlap and you know whether you can still discriminate between the features you're you're interested in so you know it, it might not be an issue at, at the end of the day you know you might not need perfection i mean it depends what you're trying to do well, and you know how narrow your your features are and uh, you know, yeah well wasn't... absolutely i know um from my experience and research of people mm. who spent a long time including myself at some points fixing mm. things that aren't broken <laughs> and rather than actually taking data and checking my results and finding yeah. out if if i if i'm you know I, there's been some times when i was like mm. and now i should actually go back and look at the control sample yeah <laughs> to find out that actually i've discovered something um yeah because so, i mean for, for example if you look at the the spectra for the, the apple i show in one of the, the slides um you don't actually get very sort of narrow features you know the features are quite broad so you don't actually really need a very very high resolution spectrometer in order to uh, determine a lot of things yeah. yeah yeah so can i ask are, are the filters on the ams chips um sort of interference filters um yeah, yes yes on the visible and the, the near ir chips oh, take it right but my very first job was working for mm. infrared engineering limited at molden mm. and i actually was the one making um uh, thin film interference filters there so. mm. yeah yeah, no, right. yeah that's, that's interesting yes it, it's quite a challenging job to do that isn't it and, uh, oh, well i, mean, I guess probably you you had to make many many different variants to did you to get them right Exactly. Pretty much, you know, you'd put a hundred uh, substrates into the into the vacuum deposition chamber, and maybe one mm. would come out of the right wavelength. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the good thing about AMS, you know, they have a history of doing this. You know, which um, a lot of other companies don't. So, I mean, that's why there's not actually not too much competition in this uh, in this field of, of these multispectral sensor chips because um, it's quite difficult to actually achieve um, the performance in terms of the, the optical filters. Yeah. But yeah, they do all, all that um, in-house. They have a, a site in, in Austria, they do the deposition. So, so do you know, to, I, I think it was, was it Tim who had the question about how, how can this be used for checking up on a brew? <laughs> <laughs> do, do you have anyone, does anyone have any experience in that? Uh, Ah, I don't know. Um, a brew is it as in brewing beer? Yeah, yeah. So um, things like uh, uh, 
how the how the um, oxygen um, how the alcohol concentration is changing or how you, uh, as the glucose or sugars mm. are the alcohol. So that that will presumably change things, and of course the flocculation, um, you know, the, and, and the color. So the number mm. of number of different things. I think they're all sort of relative, i.e. You know, on day one, you know, it'll be one thing, and then it'll sort of progress mm. over sort of um, five or six days of brewing. So it, it it might not be a matter of getting absolute values, but mm. the relative, so that you know where you are on the on the. Thing. Yeah, I mean, if you can see the color changing, I mean, that gives you a, a good indication that you, you are able to then detect something. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean. You, I mean, I'm sure there's papers out there where people have done spectroscopy and, um, you know, maybe if you can find some of those, you can actually see what the, the main bands of interest are and um, yeah. see how easy it would be to detect those. You know. That's right. Mm. I think part of the trick in brewing is you get a really good brew and then you wonder, mm. how do I do that again, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the, the critical thing, isn't it? Lost cause. Um, yes. <laughs> if you can somehow track what you're doing and then see how mm. you do things. Uh, one of the yeah, I, I mean, the other, well, the way of doing it is just to take an experimental approach and, you know, just buy one. I mean, as I say, they're pretty cheap, these, these sensors. You could just buy one off the shelf and just connect it up. And um, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of, I think all the boards, they have integrated LED, so you don't even need a, a separate LED, and you know, so you could just shine it at the, the brew and, and see what you get. Yeah, yeah. I think, Chine, you, you have something. To yeah, um, if there is no color change in the brew, you know, if you are just measuring, um, if, if there is color change, yes, you know, this cheap spectral sensors work, but if there is no color change, the other way of looking at it is using ground spectrometer, which is kind of costly, but there are some open source versions I kept a few slides in the presentation. When I upload the presentation, you can see it in the open source versions. Uh, otherwise, there is, um, you know, if you think that there is a, if not color change, but turbidity change, that's also a good indicator. Then we can again go a low cost, you know, version. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this, these um, chip based sensors, they do also sense in, in the near IR as well. So outside the visible spectrum. So, I mean, there may be some changes which you can't actually observe visually. Yeah, I've actually got an AMS sensor on order, so. Mm, oh, great. And some good good. Yeah. You should report back and maybe do another <laughs> presentation. I have one in the hand, you know, if anybody would like to have. All uh, right. Ooh. Yeah. I did, I did have a colleague once who, who, who combined looking through the sample. So I think they did the kind of standard, the LED illuminates mm. the sample, and, and they put one sideways on. And that was for the turbidity. I think if I understand what turbidity is, and I probably don't, but even then it might produce interesting results, even if I'm mm. wrong, my, yeah. my approach is wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, the, I mean, the, it depends on the nature of the, the scattering that, that goes on, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. The light and, and, um, yeah, I mean. and I think it should be a dialogue between whether it theoretically makes mm. any sense and whether it experimentally makes any sense. And at some oh, point, yes. if you can ever get them to agree, then you're doing mm. well. Well, yes, yeah, exactly. And yeah, I mean, calibration is is critical. And um, yeah, as I, as I mentioned, um, one of the, the key uh, factors is, is the LEDs and, you know, that the response of those changes with the, with temperature. So um, if the room room temperature changes, for example, or they they warm up due to self heating. So I mean, if you if you can use some sort of calibration tool, um, that's the ideal. You know, even if it's just a piece of white paper or or something like that, or a really simple reflective surface. You know, um, just something yeah. to make it more more consistent. Mm. Mm. Well, yes, yeah, sometimes people get very upset with like how many digits can they get? How many bits can they get? But actually, sometimes mm. you, you can do with quite a, if you know something is absolutely accurate, mm. but only to say a percent. Yes. Um, but, 
but then you know that that is within a percent mm. of where you go. So, so precision is not necessarily precision and accuracy are not the same things. No, no, exactly. Yeah, some people, sometimes people get carried away with uh, like a number of bits of resolution. But um, I mean, for example, with these sensors, they have sixteen bit ADCs. But uh, you know, I doubt you're going to get that, uh, that good accuracy. You know, <laughs> mm, mm. I th some white, a path to madness. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Your noise is going to dominate all the, all the time, and you're offsetting. So, yeah. 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 Anybody so, interested in the slides, you know, I would like to upload um, to whatever the platform uh, we are going to use. I'll upload, you know, after some small edits with the links. Uh, so I think we can upload them as Google Slides into the Google site. Okay. And give the shareable link. Do we have an account from Biomaker Space or shall I do it from my personal account? Um, yeah, I think you share if you share the um, like an editable link on um, the Google group, I think somebody who has a make space address can add them to the Google site. We'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs> In case you haven't realized yet, it's, <laughs> everything's very new for those who haven't. This is our first first meeting, so still figuring out how to do stuff. But I think it's I think it's reasonably easy to copy to, to add a Google Slides to the site. And there's numerous people, at least Simon, myself, Katia, and a couple of other people have access to the site. Yeah, we'll make it happen, Tina. Don't worry. Okay, no worries. Any biologists in the room got questions? Have you got problems that you would like Tina and, and <laughs> Richard to solve for you? So it's quite interesting to try and coming in from new. I don't know what um, a spectrometer solves for. Well, I wouldn't say a typical biology problem because I imagine there's no such thing. But uh, where are people looking to use optical methods? All right. So um, yeah. So for example, you know, if if, if you have a, a production process, um, you know, you want to measure the, the ripeness of apples, um, for example, um, before you package them, um, then you, you can't, uh, you know, take a sample from e each one. So um, a better method would be to use a, an optical sensor um, to do the, the sensing and um, correlate the, the ripeness with uh, some optical effects. Um, just to chip in on that, not as a biologist, of course, but uh, from my experience at Inbred Engineering Limited, the real point there was to make sensors, as, as you were saying, for production lines, um, where the rotational frequency of many uh, organic molecules are in the infrared range. So you try and tune a narrowband filter for whatever particular molecule you wanted to see in the production line. Water was a very popular one. Um, but I think you could also detect nicotine in tobacco plants, leaves going past, mm -hmm. and you would shine a, a, a light onto the conveyor belt and keep sampling the, the reflected light, trying to narrow in on one of these particular rotational frequencies that you were interested in. So presumably in any you know, biological experiment, if a change is going on, such as an increase in ethanol in your beer, um, it would be possible to detect that. I don't know whether ethanol has a convenient rotational frequency. <laughs> ah, Jenny's got an answer. Little peek. Yes, yeah, so I'm not actually a biologist, so um, I don't know. Uh, you know, may maybe other people have have applications in, in biology. Uh, um, is it? As I mentioned in the earlier, uh, you know, many biologists use the spectrophotometers for the uh, measuring the protein content in a, a small volume when they are making the proteins and you know, mm -hmm. actually DNA, RNA, or something like that. And also the fluorescent, if, if some uh, they modify, they add the fluorescent tag and try to see how much the bacteria is expressing that protein by measuring the fluorescence coming out of it. So these are you know, and recent COVID testing. 
I mean, it's not respect of photometry in true sense, but uh, lamp assays they can see if the color changed after the reaction. If it is yellow or you know um, blue, depending on that color change, one can say the COVID positive or COVID negative. So these are all some of, some examples, you know. In biology. Did you have a point? If 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 I can add something from biology. As well, I, I, I was raising the hand. So for example, at the moment we are working with a modified green fluorescent protein with the GFP. And there we uh, had an extra two cysteines that they can form a disulfide bond when the environment of the cell is more oxidized and then change the peak of excitation of the GFP. So in real time, depending on which peak of excitation you're looking, you can see real time changes of redox biology in cells only based on spectrophotometry. And these changes are measured not in, in lysate uh, cells, they're, they're living cells that can go uh, to a more oxidized uh, condition after stress and you can follow up the recovery in real time. So these tools and, uh, could be very helpful for us because we depend on very expensive equipment. Mm. Yeah, that's so that's you're, you're, you're injecting some sort of fluorescent um, no, bio. What, what we have is actually uh, the GFP that we put a promoter from a virus that is expressing mm. plants and we make transgenic plants that express the sensor constitutively. So you have mm. like, I, I think Gina mentioned the biohacker system or the biohacker series is the same. We have fluorescent plants. Mm. A green, green fluorescent protein, it basically takes blue light and turns it into green light. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm. so you shine in blue light and it comes mm. out green and then you measure the amount of green. That's pretty much the sort of the mm. basis of a lot of these systems. Um, ah. You can get some of them that don't, that they don't have that like what change of wavelengths, transformation of wavelength. They just, they just look like a particular color. So we, we also tag, pro, use proteins that kind of attach the proteins we're interested in, but they just look pink or they look blue. And so you grow your bacteria and slowly, slowly the, the kind of flask that you got the bacteria, they all start turning pink because they're kind of expressing. So there's different ways of, of, of doing it. But um, yeah, the, the protein, the color proteins are very cool. Is, is this where the UV comes in? Because yeah, I know our discussion was very infrared rated as, from our backgrounds, but uh, you were mentioning a lot about the UV and the importance yeah, of the UV. Yeah, UV, UV for living stuff, which is what Jose was mentioning. We try and avoid UV in living things because they, they, don't, they don't like it. <laughs> not shining UV light on your bacteria. You're not going to have any bacteria left, unfortunately. Yes. That's kind of the point. <laughs> so I yeah our spectrometer sterilized the sample yeah exactly. well, that's why you know we use uv to kind of yeah exactly sterilize everything um especially now with covid they're like inventing uv rooms and everything um, mm -hmm. but no it's um so the uv is because with some of the biomolecules like dna rna and protein you you need that level of intensity to to kind of read them basically um i mean someone who knows physics could describe it better so he's trying to put put excitation into the molecules and yeah. you, know, you know you can do it with uv yeah and quite whereas quite, yeah, exactly and you look at you look at ratios between different um wavelengths of uv as well and that can tell you about what the composition of the sample is so basically we, we, for, for biologists you look at your spectrum and you kind of know if it's actually dna or if you've left when you're doing the purification process you might have got some chemicals that contaminated along the way and if you don't wash your DNA properly at the end, you can see on the spectrum, oh, hang on a minute, some of the chemicals from earlier in the process are still in the sample. So that's kind of why it's helpful. And it's sort of that the ratios between the different, um, we have yeah, particular ratios we look at that say, is it pure or is it not? And then if you go back to the spectrum, you can actually often work out exactly what contaminant is in there. And that requires UV. Um, and also when you're when you're looking at proteins, I mean, proteins, you can you can see them with a, with a UV um, in the UV range. So if you're making proteins and you're purifying them, what you often do is like pass proteins through a column to which some of the proteins stick and others don't, for example. And at the end of the column, you might have a UV light, which again, is not really spectrophotometry. You're just looking, it's just like, is the UV light getting through or not? <laughs> and kind of, and you can use that to tell if your protein is, is flowing out of the column. Mm. Um, and so often you, oftentimes you can sort of, um, yeah, you'll work out like how long it takes for the protein that you want to come through 
by using this UV and sort of seeing the peak of when it's flowing down because you'll kind of wash everything else out and then you'll start putting a chemical in that tries to break the protein you want off of the column it's stuck to. And then you'll, you should see a point where the UV kind of um, spectrum increases on your monitor or decreases, I guess it's in resorbance. Mm. Um, and so you can actually tell when stuff is coming through. So a lot of this monitoring. Mm. Uh, but the thing is we do it all with super expensive equipment <laughs> and yeah. usually not, not real time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so this, and, and this is a question I came across because I've been trying to do a startup and I, I, I mean, I'm not biology, I'm semiconductor, but then I was reading what, how, how careful do I need to be to make my processes work? which is probably something that maybe is relatable to you. So everyone's saying, oh, you need the purest water and you need the purest this. And I was like, well, how pure do you need to be to get the result that I want? Because I only need to demonstrate that something works at all. And then in, if it works at all, then I can invest in bringing it down. Is that something that you have in the biology area that you can... You could because presumably you could be quite militant about a great many things or requiring very expensive reagents and instruments. So how do you know when enough what is enough to see your results? Or is this a huge, am I just opening a huge question? Well, it, um, it depends what you want. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm probably slightly biased because a lot of my work is actually figuring out what is good enough for certain experiments and not using ultra pure reagents because we work a lot with labs um, for example, in Cameroon and Ghana, where it's really challenging to import reagents. And so they're making their own. In fact, right now, downstairs right now, I have a water distiller running that I can compare like the purity of water coming out of one of these. It looks like a massive tea urn, <laughs> basically, yeah. the water. I've also got a domestic uh, deionization UV treatment water system downstairs as well. So we're going to try and figure out what's the best system we can send to Cameroon because they just, they, they don't have domestic purification systems are not commonly available there and the lab systems are just horrendously expensive and so that's exactly our question is what what's what purity of water do we need and we'll be using a conductivity meter rather than a spectrophotometer to figure out uh, we might use some spectrophotometry but it's mostly conductivity and then mm. once it's there or well before we ship it we'll figure out what do we actually need the water for and then work out is it good enough for that <laughs> so, and if it's good yeah. enough for that then we'll use it but it does re require you to know what you're aiming for and um and plan accordingly i think a lot of the i mean chenna can talk about some of the feedback that he got from the paper a, a lot of the um criticism of stuff like the hacking of of um you know low cost equipment or diy equipment and sort of 3d printed made equipment is like well how do you know it's as high quality as the stuff you buy for loads of money off the shelf and is it good enough for what you want to do and the kind of answer to that as well depends on what your experiment is and what yeah. actually, if your experiment is yes or no then you don't actually need it to be that brilliant if your experiment is i need the results within 0 0.001 accuracy then yeah probably <laughs> you're gonna have to spend yeah. money so so it really depends you have to lead with the science and figure out what is the scientific result you're trying to get and does this equipment kind of back it up and also like china said actually part of the problem is reinventing the wheel the people who do those spectrophotometers have done some work on the quality assurance because they need to actually work, otherwise people will be returning all their product to them. And one of the challenges of building your own equipment is like building in enough quality control steps and calibration steps. And that's the piece where people tend to not do it because it's hard. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know the hard thing because having come from physics, I found that, that when I moved to Cambridge, um, people didn't check they just used to talk about, well, we need high quality. And I said, so what's that in numbers? And they'd be like, don't, don't, how dare you? <laughs> it's like kind of the response. And I'm like, but no, but what, is that enough or not? And uh, I, I remember asking a student about what they needed in a sample and they talked to their professor and the professor told them not to answer to me because I might try and give them something worse. <laughs> <And I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, I came to I hadn't been I, I kind of I was a toss-up between doing science and design and in design it was like well what are you doing and <laughs> is this a, and and the marking scheme for a level design is quite interesting because to get a b you need to end up in a dead end that's bad enough that you have to go back at least one step and change something fundamental and to get an a you have to do it again 
And so <laughs> there are loads of people like, you mean I have to make mistakes to get an A? And uh, you're not realizing that actually you've got to look at, have you spotted a problem? Is that problem something I need to fix? And I think that that's that, I mean, that's presumably where the value of all these sensors are going to be, like spotting a problem and saying, do I need to fix this or can I go without it? Yeah. And another criticism of the flip side of buying all your expensive lab equipment and never actually knowing how it's built is that you often just get <laughs> the numbers out and you don't really understand how the numbers came to happen. Um, because as a molecular, certainly as if you're coming through entirely through biology, you don't really get, I mean, you sort of get taught theoretically in lectures how the equipment works, but you never really have a good understanding of anything to do with how it's calibrated or what might go wrong or what the tolerances are and everything like that. So that's one of the reasons why some of this type of stuff can, can be helpful um, to not like blindly follow <laughs> what the thing is saying. Well, Katia, you remember we had that visit from the guys from TP, TTP came to buy a make space and they were quite pleased with the concept of a space where biologists and kind of um, engineers could work together because that's apparently one of the problems they have with hiring consultants in the biology space is that they're not very good at problem solving when it comes to like devices, which is a lot of what TTP do, is finding someone who's a hardcore biologist that really gets the kind of breaking down of equipment and how it's working and, and the problem solving of that is, is they find quite hard. And if Cathy, you remember that <laughs> conversation. Yeah, no, no, I remember. And it's, it's um, you know, it's part of the hardware and it's part of the reagents also, because in, in biology, you know, in my time, we had to make lots of things ourselves. And so you had first principles and you made all the buffers and you made everything together. And over the years, it, things have become much more kit based. So if the kit doesn't work, then unless you understand all the principles behind how it works, then people just say, oh, the kit doesn't work and just throw it and get something new, which is okay if you've got a really expensive, you know, a lab with lots of money. Um, but if you really, you know, working on a shoestring somewhere, you really need to know first principles and how to troubleshoot. And it's the same thing with equipment. You know, you've got expensive equipment that you use you might calibrate it wrongly because you don't know how it works. And then, you know, it's like rubbish in, rubbish out. And so, but it's, it was true. They were looking for more people that could troubleshoot. And that's why our kind of community is, is, a, is a good one because we do, I mean, like, like what China and, and Venki are doing is taking things apart and building them up again and using them for other things. So, you'd know. Yeah. how to do it. So. Oh, so amazing. Amazing. Um, so Peter was asking how accurate you could be and this thing. These these small devices, even though they are built from these commercial grade small fitness trackers and stuff, they, they increase accuracy of the total experiment in a big scale. For example, um, the bacterial OD monitoring. They used to take a sample out of the uh, flask every 20 minutes in a cuet. And that introduces a serious contamination. And um, usually the spectrophotometer is on a beside in a bench, not inside the hood. And every time you're taking, opening the bottle, you're introducing contamination. But in, in China's device there, once the bacteria goes in there, it will stay in there until it reaches whatever concentration you're expecting. So the, the sampling is gone. And actually you're solving a problem in increasing the um, accuracy of the whole process rather than having multiple um, risks of contamination or losing the sample and, and these things. So I think these low cost hardware have a point where they can, they can solve specific problems just to fit wherever you're trying to achieve the accuracy instead of being a bench stop where you have everything to be done, but you need to adjust your base according to the bench stop um, traditional instrument. I really like the sound of this because it's got the eye on the goal and not having you know, this idea. I mean, if you, Having now spent a, a year or year and a half in, in, in like doing things as a business, it's it's kind of interesting. You know, one of the points is everyone says, "Well, it, you know, do you have a business? Well, do you have a customer? <laughs> is, are they happy? Yeah, you know, what are you doing it for?" And doing that, so I I did work in a group for a while where they would always pick the most expensive option with the most posh sounding salesman, and. And they got ripped off so much and, and, I, and, and they didn't get on with them because I was saying, but why would, why did you purchase it from them and not from, yeah. And I'd ask questions like that and they would, they, they, they cause I, I don't think they were kind of thinking, what am I going to get for buying, you know, what, what, what's my objective in this? Um, and, and, uh, and that is always a, a, a key thing, which like you say, can be very difficult, especially if you get a field that becomes well-funded 
and actually then it becomes less often that you actually have to open up something and look at it yourself and i know i'm certainly one of the criticisms i'm you know that, that can be leveled at me as i take everything apart whether, whether i'm supposed to or not um but, but that's helped me so far because i've been running my startup off ebay equipment and uh, I've, had, I've had some quite good, quite efficient purchases where something said error all over it. But I, I, I've been able, I, I, I'm aware those errors are because it's not plugged in. So I'll take a risk on that and say something that costs a thousand pounds would cost me 50 pounds because it said it was broken. <laughs> but, but, you know, you look up the manual and you find out. And, and, and so actually kind of... Um, I, one of the things that really stuck with me is I talked to a PhD student about designing their sample. And they'd always just been given a sample design. And I said, well, here's a program. You can look at what it does. It'll give you a thing. And even if you come up with nothing, you can say, well, here's what you might try to change. And it doesn't work. Yeah, it, 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 would, it gives me what I want, but I lose 10% efficiency. And this is bad. And that would be a whole chapter in your PhD. And the student turned around to me and said, oh, no one's ever talked to me about my PhD thesis. And this was a third year student. And a I don't know. Maybe it's a, maybe it was just a bad group, but uh, like literally, levels, they, levels of efficiency and ergonomics should not enter biology labs. I think we've already learned that. Oh yeah, happening. right. But also, there was a PhD student who gave a very impassioned talk at Cafe Synthetique, which is another event which will hopefully launch again post pandemic, and everybody should go to if they're in Cambridge. Um, but yeah, about automation, he means he comes from a kind of more engineering background, and just like the amount of people who just perpet stuff day in day out when there are robots that can do this they're just expensive but they're, they're reducing in price um but he did a straw poll i guess it was a pub of like 25 mostly phd students because it was a phd student night um and asked how many of them had ever used like robotic support in terms of like liquid handling so most biologists they just pet stuff all day long um and basically no one put their hands up and then one person put his hand up and i said i had a pipette with eight channels is that kind does that count <laughs> i was like it's a hand pipette but it does eight of the eight at a time and that was the closest yeah. anyone in that pub had got to using all <laughs> that actually yeah. and so it's but molecular biology in particular biology in general is not it, it if you come to it with an engineer's eyes you'd be shocked at some of the some of the ways that we work um which is why these groups are so helpful because you can like enlighten us <laughs> every group has the same problem so i remember visiting a group a photonics group in scotland and they they said we're going for a walk at the weekend and i forgot a walk in scotland is 17 miles and it took me about a week to recover from this um because i wasn't used to but their supervisor realized rather than buying uh, one centimeter square bits of glass they had to be coated in a, a certain chem a certain um, material um he, re he could buy meter squared bits of the same like one millimeter thick glass and a glass cutter and a ruler and said oh we've, i've saved so much money <laughs> and the students had to go and cut out one centimeter squares out of this glass and they were having like a whole field that I, I i think this is a a similar thing that that, that you know people don't necessarily work out what's the most efficient way to do a thing and and I am reminded of a career thing where the careers person giving it said the worst thing they'd ever seen on someone's uh, CV was that they quoted adequate pipettist and they were like five years of postdoc research. <laughs> and they, they said they were I prove this as well. <laughs> but adequate pipettist. <laughs> <laughs> Well, has anyone else got tales of the lab that they uh, they think could be improved by stuff that they've heard today or any other technology? I mean, if I should chip in here, it's, it's probably, I mean, I'm also doing quite a lot of molecular biology and now you've been discussing quite a bit of efficiency and like how we can do a lot of stuff to to probably not use quite as pure water or use like quite as expensive uh, chemicals to do our process. And I think generally it's true that many of, of like the reactions we are trying to do in the lab are quite tolerant actually to, to quite large deviations, even like adding maybe 50% more or less of certain reagents uh, in, in some cases. But usually the problem is, isn't like what is the cheapest way to do something, at least generally in my experience is just to get stuff working and then once you have found 
actually a way of like a stable way of doing whatever you're trying to do then you can begin to optimize your process you can begin to try okay okay now i have a general good method for i don't know in my case it could be expressing a protein uh, or well no, that would be a bad example but maybe purifying some dna uh, you have corona culture and you want to purify some dna and there are some several strips these are by now pretty well established but at some point you have like I'm sure people had, have struggled a lot with, with getting everything to work. And the general issue with molecular biology is that you usually have some transparent liquids that you mix with some transparent liquids, and then you put them in a heating plug and you take them out and they're still transparent and you put them on some ice and add some other transparent liquids. And after six or 10 steps of these transparent liquids being mixed together without being able at any point to see whether you did something wrong, you at the end go out and do an analysis that says this experiment succeeded or this experiment failed. And I think if you try to go out and do these optimizations before you have even gotten to a point where it's actually just working, then you introduce a lot of potential errors and a lot of the work is just figuring out how do I develop a method that is, is stable enough to actually work um, and usually using less pure water might work, but it also potentially introduces yet another source of error. And a lot of my work is to figure out what error that I make today and what can I do to not make that error next time I work, like do my experiments. So, so trying to use like ultra pure water and all of these high grade chemicals is usually a good starting point because it's just a way of minimizing potential things that could go wrong. And then once you have established this works, then you can go through the engineering process of like figuring out, okay, how tolerant are we to actually uh, having, I don't know, um, um, yeah, ions in your water or how pure does my reagents needs to be in order to get it work? How important is it? It is, it is exactly one minute or two minutes at 45 degrees, whatever. Yeah. The uh, one, one um, a quick example is that when I was, I was trying to build some protein nano cages, which self assemble themselves upon um, a chemical reaction. They just all little molecules, they form as a globe, like, or, or a spherical kind of thing when they come together. And when they come together, they give out light. And I was trying to do that in the lab. And during that time is when Chinna entered the lab and said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I have to stay here for a few more hours. Why? I'm measuring bacteria. And like, so what? And then we did that 20 minutes interval with the bacteria. And I didn't finish the cage project. I was supposed to complete it in six months. And it took about two years to complete the cage project. Because in meanwhile, <laughs> Chinna came and started this um, optical um, device, monitoring device. And it was just to fix that one problem of me not going to do that every 20 minutes thing. But that took about six or seven months, sidetrack of the game. So for a biologist to, to get into automation and everything, the skill set, the basic skill set of programming or, or um, automating and, and, and engineering are, are not, that, if not the foundation or, or the projects don't have that room to, to experiments on these because they can take up time sometimes. Sometimes it could be just a small thing of using a device that's out there, like a liquid handling robot, which you can buy. But sometimes fixing the engineering problems, I think need an external support rather than the biologist doing it themselves in there. Uh, but the clubs like these, the hackers club like these are a great spot to meet people, you know, which can, they can help to achieve those kind of um, small solutions. Well, they definitely can help, but it's, I think it's called opportunity cost, that you can solve the problem, but what's the cost in solving that problem? Um, so my dad actually does uh, photography, and he's done photography of in tiny insects. And what you do is you can take lots of pictures and just change the focus slightly each time. And the software you can get that will put that together and make the whole thing go in focus and do that. And so loads of people in this photography club are saying oh you need to get like a motor and have a stage like move the camera for you and in the end 
kind of went through all those stages and in the end what did was took the motor off and put a knob on the end and actually just turned it by hand and uh and, and did it and it went through this whole stage of starting with something simple then automating it then actually realizing that the automation took more time and going back to manual um so it can be very i think that's exactly that's the, an example of what you're you yeah, mentioning it you really need to understand the process sometimes to automate it and if you don't understand it and and uh, uh joan's point um yeah jim's point um yeah you need to make you need to know how to make the process work once before you work out how to make it work a thousand times but uh it's it's interesting how i think a lot of academic particularly and, and lab things you have one people have a very set route to how they got to where they are and they don't necessarily have a broader experience of what worked for other people and so there's an interesting thing i spent some time in cafes over one summer in cambridge and listening to a general background chat about different departments and engineer people seem to really love the engineering department but people hated physics like in physics, yeah, physics, apparently people thought that, that, that everyone knows how to do everything themselves and won't trust other people. Whereas in engineering, they trust other people and they are always collaborative about everything. And so it was interesting to hear the different uh, conversations, like background conversations about you know, complaining about work. But like, I think a lot of it is being open to what other people have been able to achieve in their own work, even if it's not immediately obvious how it would work for my, for my own stuff. I don't know what other people... Sorry, I, I hope I'm not monopolising the conversation here. <laughs> well, I, was, I just mentioned in the chat, but Fan, I'm interested in your thoughts on this from the sort of lab sustainability perspective. Um, from kind of both, I guess, in terms of the hacking of devices and DIY electronics, but also, um, you know, reagents and kind of where the people do or don't use <laughs> the latest and greatest stuff. Is there anything that kind of this links to your work? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of uh, really interesting things that we're talking about here. And this is why this was a great seminar to go to, because sometimes you're right, sometimes that people are spending too much money and too much effort. And as you were saying, like, you know, you get the latest and greatest equipment, it's really expensive, you're throwing away your old equipment, just because I think somebody else was saying, you know, that you just think the kit isn't working. But actually, if you would take a little bit more and understand what's happening, um, there's some great ways that you can refurbish your equipment, better maintain it. Um, and for labs that don't have a lot of money, sustainability kind of goes hand in hand, right? So something like this is great for people who want to be, well, you don't want to use all those cuvettes um, all the time, right? You have all these cuvettes that you're throwing away. Maybe this is a way, you know, we can adapt something like this where we can then reuse the things that we're um, looking at. And I think that, um, I think, was his name Joan, who was talking about, you know, things like um, improve, like using lower water quality and seeing if it still work for your experiments. I mean, if you, uh, millipore water takes, I think DI water so takes something like three times, like you waste three times the water that you actually get out just to make the DI water, right? Yeah. So if you the lower grade water, um, you can actually save on a lot of sustainability, a lot of consumables there. So I think we're having a lot of really great conversations that can uh, really help people when it comes to looking at sustainability in the lab. Yeah, the, the water thing is, is actually surprisingly big. Um, for inorganic semiconductors, they use vast amounts of water because they want pure water. They use vast amounts of pure water, and that means even vaster amounts of ultra pure water. Um, oh. oh, thanks for joining us. Um, and that's been one of the things I've been looking at is do I need it? It's cost a lot of money, but I, I don't know the answer to whether I can skimp on it. So I've, I've, I kind of had to go for it. But then I realized for every few liters of water I would get out of it, I'd be dumping 50, 100 liters of water down the drain. It's, it's a bit insane. And it's strange because the place I've set up with, no one's really using any water and they're saying, oh, you don't really use any water except for your kettle, right? And I'm like, well, actually, it's going to be quite bad. <laughs> like the biomake space, it's office space and then a minus 80 freezer. Like we're not using that much. Else. 
electricity. I mean, you know, it's just gonna, <laughs> we're probably using about the same electricity as in the entire floor. <laughs> hey, Je um, Jenny, the, I mean, I really like this sort of, um, well, the talk of, uh, you know, there's bio biologists doing things, but not, f not having the time or maybe the expertise, but it sounds like actually the time to look at how you could reimagine how to do a, a project because I'm with you, Biologist, biology seems very um, primitive in the tools that it's using in many ways, right? Very, very manual. It seems crazy, in fact. Um, is there any way that, but I think from the engineering side of like, you know, all the things um, people in make space, they don't understand the problems that you're faced with at all. Um, is there any way where somehow people who've got insights into that, there's a sense that I know something about their experiments could be automated or improved or, you know, running a hundred of these experiments in parallel and knowing that 60 of them fail is actually more efficient than trying to get one perfect. Um, you know, any of those, if there's the people who can sort of understand the problem, like they understand the domain, the biology domain, but they, they have the inkling that, you know, this, this is probably possible. I don't have the capability, but I can see that there's something. Is there a way we could kind of, surface that because i swear there's a lot of people who if you showed them a problem would love to try and help fix it right yeah, i think especially from an engineering side a lot of engineers are very good at solving problems but they're not necessarily very good at understanding what the problem to solve is i don't i don't know how you can do that but i'd i'd be really interested run a survey i guess you could run a, yeah. a survey and that might, that might i guess yeah yeah well one of, one of the things that i would say is that um you know, if you, you're looking at like lab units where each of the individuals doesn't generally doesn't need to do high throughput things all at once, they need to do things sequentially. Mm. Um, if you then say, well, let's look at it at a lab, lab scale, then you have a, let's say that the lab then says, oh, we want to automate everyone's DNA preps or something like this then they would have to coordinate with each other to try and make it make a it, use that doesn't of this. Seem, that doesn't so seem that doesn't seem. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine in a lot of what biomake space people are doing, a lot of it is not about scaling up a process. Mm. I, I can imagine that there are people who want to do that, they want to work out, but I would imagine most of it is actually about, is there a way that I could make this go faster? Or could I more reliably get through a process, right? Because actually the failure, you know, spending, five hours and then it failing is a huge amount of wasted time right um so there's different ways yes, that you so can improve reliability or whatever you know one is you you assume that stuff's going to fail when you do probabilistic type stuff or the other one is you put in stuff that helps know, reduce contamination because it's automated or yeah you know, I, I don't know that's the point i don't know what it is but it feels like you have a certain type of projects presumably yeah. that yeah I think maybe of... just kind of finding out what those what those specific mm. things are because uh, it, and and that that are um, a problem to enough people for it to be a problem to be solved. Like I don't think what, it, I um, think it can just be a problem to one person. I really do. But uh, but your insight into the it not being a mass mm. automation is a good one, right? That's probably not mm. high on the agenda. But I don't think we should assume that it has to be solved by lots of people. I think if one biologist has got a problem and we find someone who is intrigued enough to go and try and help them do it. It doesn't have to, you know, this is not about like- <laughs> No, 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 yeah, but it would make financial it would make viability, sense. right? It's just someone no, no, who no, wants no. to help and learn, right? But what, for example, if China, you know, where, where you had the problem of measuring density in yeah, samples, amazing, yeah. all, of, all of the people that grow bacteria and need to do something with it afterwards, they will have to go through these steps. So it's, it's a really, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a big opportunity that, that one person might uncover um, and as I said, somebody might come with a similar, whatever that might be, and it could be right. one person, but it could be a, a much larger person, a, a much larger, you know. Yeah, I, th I think the other people that need this. Yeah. Yeah. The, the advantage we have potentially in the group of people who are interested in this is it doesn't have to like meet some sort of ROI calculation. Right. So it no. doesn't have to be immortized a lot no, no. Of, across a lot of people because it could be, you know, let's say I want I wanted to I, I, I found a problem. I could help them mm. do that, not me personally, but as an example. Um, and through that, I would learn a lot more about the biology that I'm interested in, mm -hmm. right? Because it's, 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 it's a routine. I'm spending time with someone who knows about this, right? And yeah. 
and the return that's the return right so it doesn't have to be efficient it doesn't have to solve it doesn't you know i might solve it for one person and it really is just their problem yeah. but like it is oh. like also if i solve it for one problem it solves it for a hundred right that's we, cool as well we, but it we doesn't could have need... a, we could have a session bring your biology problem yeah, to yeah the exactly. engineering community <laughs> oh, what a great know, idea, i need yeah. a widget like this <laughs> i know that 10 engineers would say yeah i made one before here you can have yeah, it, yeah. Adapt it. <laughs> and on the google group, put your problems on there and we can... yeah 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 <laughs> I, mean, I, yeah, think, I, I, don't, I don't know, is it possible like to split up into different groups in, in Zoom and, you know, people have particular problems, maybe you can split yeah, up. Yeah, we kept it simple this time, but you, there are breakout out. rooms and we mm. could we could see breakout rooms with problems and have little kind mm. of mind... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, getting minds yeah, but it, It's but also it's the biologists, I, I don't know if everybody thinks of them as a big problem. Um, I certainly didn't realise how much time I'm wasting on just monitoring optical density. Until I I made that calculation that it is 9,000 hours nearly in, in a okay. year. And I, and I think that's, that's a the lab. thing. A so lot, it lot of people, people work from We take it as a normal thing. You're For a biologist, you have to... This is, yeah. this is a regular life. But seeing it as a problem is very interesting. And if you ask a biologist to bring a problem, I, I don't know if he's efficient enough to identify this is actually a problem until unless he knows that there's a way to automate it. <clears throat> yeah, that is, very, a very, that is a really good point. That is a really excellent Agreed. point that you don't know it's a problem until someone's like yeah. taking the weight off your shoulders. If, if Chinna didn't walk in there and then told this could be automated, then it relieved of me. Only then it became a problem. Until then it became a normal thing. It, it, it's a tough thing, but it's a normal day-to-day -day activity. I have to do this as a job kind of thing. And I would estimate if someone asked me how long this will take, I'll estimate my time accordingly and tell this as long as it's going to take. But only when I knew the solution and how fast I could do with it, then it became a problem. And then the engineering side came to it. Okay. Well, if anyone's got ideas of how to get that happening i think that could lead to some really really exciting yeah, yeah. Make, I, I, make space is already quite good on that if i yeah. can. i'll just put it yeah. because i remember coming to the first time i thought i'd come to make spaces i can go there and i can do these things myself and i started trying to do something and like three different people came from three different sides and were like whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> like took the stuff off my hand it's like well i'll sort this out in a moment for you <laughs> they tell you contrary contrary things you know, you get. <laughs> and, and, and so the first time it's happened i was a bit like what the hell guys i wanted to do this myself and but but, but no one was listening to me and they fixed everything for me like 10 times quicker than i could have done it myself and actually i, I came to quite enjoy that but uh, yeah the first time was quite a surprise <laughs> Yeah, I, I think the, sorry, it's Ward here. Um, oh, uh, the only time I've ever seen this sort of thing work consistently is when you try to not do it. Uh, and it's, it's a matter of getting different types of people together and mixing. Because a lot of the problem is what was just stated is you didn't recognize it as a problem. But if you're complaining about how much time you're spending in the lab measuring turbidity, uh, somebody with, a bio, uh, with an engineering mindset will pop up and say, well, why are you spending that much time doing something that is just shining a light through something? And, and, and then they'll start to, to, to solve the problem. But if you, if you try to force it, people spend a lot of time defining the problems in inefficient or unuseful ways because they don't have a common vocabulary. If you get together to do something else, you form a common vocabulary, then you can have a useful conversation. It's hard to, to jump into the conversation as the first step. So, um, so I think the, um, uh, we'll, the reason why MakeSpace works and the reason why groups like this work so well is we all get together because we have a, um, a common interest in something or an interest in learning something and we're focused on that. And it's the side conversations that lead to the new way of measuring turbidity or something like that. So, so, so it's, 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 a, it's almost a matter of not focusing on the problem and, 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 then, um, and, and then building up a vocabulary so that you can talk about the problem later on. Because I do yeah. have something to chip in. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can give you a list of, as a biologist, of all the tedious things I have to do every day. <laughs> do it, and, uh, do it, do it. We'll get just, just for the, because I heard that, that, that somebody said, like, maybe biologists don't know that they have a problem. And yeah, we know, but it's, it's, as you said, like we just don't have other way to do it. And we can either do it or find another way to, to do it more efficiently. And since we are not engineers, we cannot rely on the first one. The, the work needs to be done and the DNA needs to be extracted. 
um, proteins need to be purified and uh, and yeah there's a lot of things that I think that we can we can um, take advantage of each other so if if you want problems I have at least 99. Sounds like one a bi Google biologist group. anonymous or something like that right yeah. you, Sorry? Oh, biologist anonymous where you just come with your problems yes exactly yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and just basically moan and and that's what you do right you just come and moan yeah. about biology and yeah, yeah. I, I've that's, been that's, a, that's, uh, <laughs> my name is Peter and I've been a physicist for three yeah. years so 40 times to, <laughs> to measure my OD <laughs> and that's that's a real struggle well, put, put them on the Google group and just see I mean, anyway, it, it was just a, it was just I, an like observation. I, I just think you know. So my first question cool. for this would be like, okay, it's super cool to measure the OD in a 50 ml falcon tube, but for people that we grow bacteria, bacteria need to grow in a flask that is bigger on the bottom, in order for the bacteria to get aerated to grow better. So can this system be be kind of used for real? For, for people who need to 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 make bigger flasks like the Erlenmeyer Ford 400 ml flasks can be this system be adaptable can we have for example one of these fitness um, uh, trackers and and calibrated to the to the beakers each group use because we don't even use the same size of beakers even if they have the same volume like but like that, manufacturers are just different that's a great question yeah. That's a great question, and you can answer it. And that, and that, I think, is the way forwards. Is to, you know, if someone says, "Right, can we do? Do I have to use the same beaker every time?" Because um, sometimes that turns out to be practical, right? Sometimes if you just say, "Okay, right, stick with the same beaker," and you label it as yours, and if anyone touches my beaker, they're going to die. Um, <laughs> everyone's been in a lab like that. Um, but you know, if you can say, "Is there a technique that would?" not yeah you know, maybe you lose a few percent accuracy but i can live with it yeah exactly yeah, it, exactly if you know if you know what your accuracy budget so i remembered someone saying that precision design is not about using the best components for everything it's about using the worst components for everything it's but it's because you can only do that if you know what you need and you know what you don't and but the problem with doing science for the first time is uh, uh join um, said was you don't know whether or not we can use that and so you actually have to go back and forth and it's not a bad thing that sometimes you have to do it manually and you get to see all the problems firsthand and, and, and get a feeling then you can think about automating but it, it, it can often be you know um, oh good night um, so we are having a having the, the, putting one foot in and one foot out is also good because you get to see both sides. Um, Sorry, I just want to plug that it's 10 p.m. So if anyone, oh gosh, yeah, okay. <laughs> it went really fast. It was very vibrant conversation. So thank you also for your biology and anonymous yeah. suggestions for our next. Um, yes, yeah, suggestions for our meetings and also our next talk is community biology around the world. By Jen, but yeah, feel free to keep going. But yeah, if people have to leave. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thanks, Richard, for the great talks and yeah. for Therese for yes. doing the intros and outros. And uh, see you all next. Yeah, it's good to meet everyone. Bye. Absolutely, very good. Right.